All right. Hello. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. This is Legal Mistakes and Crazy Stories from the Game Industry. My name is Sean Moore, and I'm an alumni relations representative here at Full Sail University, and I'm super excited that you all are here with us today. So, all right. Well, let's get this thing started. I'd like to go ahead and introduce uh, our special guests. Firstly, we have uh, John Laster, who is a games and esports attorney. Uh, We also have Full Sail Hall of Famer Chance Glasgow, who is one of the co-founders of Infinity Ward and Call of Duty. And we have Augie Lai with Promatic. So I'm going to turn it over to the guys. Welcome. Hey, guys. Thank you so much for having us. Guys, how's it going? Good. Um, So yeah, as was mentioned, we're kind of splitting this up into kind of two sections, not two sections, but two different topics. We're talking about legal issues, legal stories, legal advice within the game industry. Um, and that's something that's very, very underlooked. I know that we're so focused now, you know, getting the knowledge that we need to, you know, be an artist, be a, a, a programmer, be a designer and whatnot. And we get together with a group of friends and we feel like we're just, oh, we're just making a project. It's fun. But don't forget to take care of legal issues because there's going to be a lot of lessons that you'll learn uh, throughout this panel of mistakes that (laughs) people like you guys, you know, like us, we're pretty much the same here. You know, game developers, people love making games, have made and how you cannot make those same mistakes and lose out on millions of dollars. So, yeah. Is that a good (laughs) synopsis, John? Yeah, I think so. And I mean, at the end of the day, for me, one thing that's always been super important to me, I used to... Uh, I started on the video game industry, kind of covering indie games, working with indie game developers. I learned really quickly how few of them actually had legal support or even, you know, um, business guidance a lot of the times. And you get some really creative people. They're putting out some really awesome games. But the reality is when you're dealing with that 800 pound gorilla on the other side of the table, when it comes to like a Microsoft or an Amazon or a Sony, you need some support of your own. And that's just something that I learned a lot on the press side. And then um, for me, I actually moved on to be a Twitch partner for a while. I was streaming for forever. I got to see how the Wild West really works on that landscape right now. And it really is kind of crazy. And I mean, I've been lucky enough to have some great clients now that I'm working full time as an attorney. I've worked with Chance and I've worked with Augie here. And I know for a fact that the two of these guys have some of the craziest stories I've ever heard in the video game industry. And that's why I was kind of excited that we were going to be able to get them in the same panel here to just kind of talk about their journey into the industry and kind of to learn a little bit from them. I wholeheartedly agree with Augie that mistakes is definitely a harsh word because the reality is you got to learn somehow. And the ideal situation is that from some of the stuff that we've kind of talked about today, hopefully you don't have to follow those exact paths that happened. Yeah. Um, and I'll let <clears throat> Augie introduce himself real quick. Yeah, yeah, let's do an intro because I don't think we've done proper intros. Go ahead, Augie. Hey, how's it going, everyone? I'm CEO of Chromatic Games. We make a game behind me called Dungeon Defenders. Uh, the first iteration of the game I made, Dungeon Defenders 1, back in 2011. We launched on PC, Xbox, PlayStation. Um, since then, we made Dungeon Defenders 2, and DDA behind me is the latest game we launched this year. Um, and we'll 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 be launching on consoles soon. Um, and um, John Lasser, lo, lo, mm-hmm. lo do people know he was an intern for Dungeon Defenders <laughs> like eight years ago, nine years ago. How long was it? And I I don't, I don't know briefly, if intern's the right word, but I definitely came in and play tested for you. For yeah, sure. you were like a QA. <laughs> intern. Yeah. I, I, I sort of remember you walking through the halls. Um, uh, back in the day, right, uh, young boy. Yeah, I'll, I'll bring hopes pizza. And like, that's like we can really pay <laughs> you and your team, <laughs> like. Um, so, but we'd always bring pizza over and say, "Hey guys, thanks for playing five hours. Here's some pizza." <laughs> yeah, um, John, you want to say kind of your background and how you got into law? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll recap what I said a little bit earlier, just really quickly. I started on the press side, saw there were a lot of mistakes being made, um, ended up as kind of an influencer myself as a Twitch partner. And then I kind of floated around after law school uh, doing kind of like a little bit of biz dev, a little bit of kind of uh, software development agreement help and stuff like that. And then eventually I moved on full time to being an attorney. And I've been incredibly lucky to work with some very, very fantastic clients Uh, I get to do a lot of things when it comes to uh, game development, um, when it comes to esports, when it comes to streaming, um, just about anything in tech. 
Uh, the reality is at the end of the day, just about anyone who is a business needs an attorney of some kind. And the reality is like, you hear the word video game law, you don't really know what that means. The reality is it's kind of a mismatch of like corporate law, intellectual property law, contracts, employment, just about anything can apply. You're seeing on uh, a huge scale right now, antitrust is the big matter that's at hand when it comes to uh, Fortnite and Apple. So just about anything can become relevant to this industry. So I'm lucky because I get to kind of work as like a fractionalized in-house counsel uh, for a lot of different game developers and companies and just kind of give them advice and help make sure that they avoid different legal pitfalls. I'll kick it over to you, Chance. Um, yeah, so my um, my background is I was born in Oklahoma. I moved to Florida when I was six. I ended up going to, I grew up in Brevard County, just east of Orlando. And I ended up going to full sale for computer animation. Um, it was a 15-month Associates of Science. Um, actually failed my rigging class, even though I was an animator for all those years. Failed my rigging class, um, retook it. And failing a class at full sale is honestly one of the best things you can do um, because you basically get double the opportunity to learn, right? It's a good way to make the most of your education is failing. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'm not saying you should fail, but I kind of am. So um, anyway, so I, I went out to uh, Los Angeles. I actually, first went to Oklahoma to see family and then to Los Angeles to look for work. I had a horrible time, worst month of my life, maybe. Um, got some work as extra, like extra work on the X-Files. Um, that's about the only work I, I could find. I actually turned it down. Uh, failed finding a CG or animation work. Headed back to Florida, stopped in Oklahoma, found out there was a company called 2015 making Medal of Honor Allied Assault, and that I had a friend that was actually interning there. I got an internship working on Medal of Honor, and then after we shipped that game, 22 of us left. We formed Infinity Ward and had to create a franchise to compete with Medal of Honor, and so we got together and we created Call of Duty, which was kind of like what Medal of Honor would have been if we didn't have EA like telling us what to do. Um, Activision gave us a lot more freedom. Uh, so now I am working as a consultant in the games industry. I'm a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council in Washington, D.C., so I'm helping them uh, solve issues of climate resilience uh, using video games, which is really cool and a new, uh, exciting venture. Um, so, yeah, there we go. Well, and I, I think for me, one of the coolest things, uh, probably because I'm a little bit of a business nerd, is how did you guys start the companies that you did end up starting? I know, Augie, you started uh, Trendy Entertainment, and then Chance, you, you were one of the original founders of you know, Infinity Award. What, what was it like actually getting that going? Go ahead, Augie. Uh, I'll start off. Um, adrenaline. It was, um, well, first of all, companies are started by people. People, <laughs> people need to realize that it's not an idea. It never starts with an idea. It always starts with a group of people. So one of my advice for people that are interested in starting their own companies is meet as many people as you can. Make friends with everyone because um, a company is not you sitting in a, in a closet writing code. It's you actually teaming up with an artist or teaming up with a financial person or teaming up with a team and creating a product that people will buy. So everyone, make lots of friends. Um, and that's how I, I got into the entrepreneurial world is um, I went out and made, I, I myself, I'm a programmer. I'm a s super introvert. Like 10 years ago, I, I barely talked like two sentences, two sentences a day. That was, that was my level cap for speaking. <laughs> um, and one thing I quickly learned because I wanted to create products, I wanted to create companies, I had to become an extrovert. I literally trained myself. Uh, like, you know, like going to the gym, you know, working out, doing my push-ups, train myself to actually complete my sentences, which I still don't do, and, 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 and uh, garner relationships so I can build companies and products I want to build. Um, so, you know, rewind 10 years ago, um, and this is where things get a little crazy. Um, well, on top of being a programmer, I'm also a, a uh, a concert violinist and I was playing in this piano trio uh, with, with a few other people and my pianist was a composer in particular he wrote music for video games so I made friends with uh, this video game composer and through him made friends with all these game designers uh, in Gainesville and when um, that 
that studio had um, a round of layoffs, everyone was thinking about, hey, I'm going to move to California or move to Michigan or up north to join the studio. I'm like, no, 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 look at this. Every, everything's here. Why don't we start a new studio together? Um, you know, I have some experience uh, raising money and making friends with investors and VCs. I'll just raise some money and let's start a company and make this game behind me, Dungeon Defenders. <laughs> and that's how it started. So lesson here, make friends. It sounds like you faked being a CEO until you just kind of ended up being one because you're faking it so long. Uh, yeah, it's, it's funny. I had no intention of being uh, a CEO. Like I was perfectly happy programming. Um, yeah. But uh, within our small group, you know, we, we realized really quickly we had to raise a lot of money to make this game. A lot of money. And in the, our small group, I was the only one that um, actually had a little experience dealing with investors and raising money. So I was like, well, you know what? I, I can do this. I'll jump on a plane and, and fly out wherever I need to go or drive wherever you need to go. Well, and, and I, and I, I think that's it. a super interesting kind of point for me is that something that gets glossed over a lot. You know, it's always like, well, we had a really good team. We had a decent idea and we were going to execute on it. But where do you get the funding? You know, and when it, you start talking to people, that always seems to be the point that kind of it goes from point A to point Z. And it's like, well, what steps are there in that process that people need to be aware of when they're trying to fund their own studio? Um, Augie, I'll let you take that because oh, okay. I'm, I'm oh, jaded. Well, I'll, I'll well, jump back today, in. There's, Chance there's has lots of options. One. Yeah. There's, yeah. There's lots of options today. We're in a really great time. Um, to be an indie studio because there's several options now uh, to, to finance the game you want. Um, I mean, one of the top ones is uh, Kickstarter, crowdfunding. Kickstarter um, has helped hundreds of games um, make it, including Dungeon Defenders Awakened behind here. We did a Kickstarter uh, a year and a half ago, two years ago. We raised uh, over a half million dollars uh, for this game. And then on top of the excitement and success of the Kickstarter, I was able to go out and raise another million dollars from um, angel investors to complete this game, um, which we're still working on, uh, work, in, work in progress. <laughs> uh, so more stuff to come from this game. We're, we're, we're launching 1.2 quite soon and um, new content um, for foreseeable future. But Kickstarter is a great way of... Um, raising raising funds and um so that would be high on my list uh that usually typically the second route of raising funds is through investors angel investors in particular um sub sub million dollar revenue you're not looking at venture capital yet mm -hmm. um venture capitalists typically they want to see revenue stream before they they put in uh a million dollars or two million. Typically, uh, VCs, you're looking at the ten million dollar range. Um, so, for everyone here, probably the angel investor route uh, is the way to go when it comes to investors. And again, you gotta make friends. Yes, I, I have a. I do have <laughs> a make friends. somewhat entertaining money raising story since we're telling stories. Yeah, too. I want to hear your story. Um, I wasn't. I wasn't the seat. My my last company, uh, Doghead Simulations, still technically exists, but I quit like three or four months ago. I was not the CEO, so I was not the money raiser, but I did raise a lot of money just because I could. And my favorite, um, the one, like the one time, I was like one for one for, actually one for two for raising money, which is pretty good. But the one time that I successfully raised money from people that I don't know, now I'm not counting the people I was connected to, um, was this guy in Brazil, right? That was a connection to other friends of mine in Brazil, right? And so um, I'm introduced to this this guy named we'll call him uh, Anderson Silva for the sake of this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> introduced to Anderson Silva through some friends, and he wants to have me come over and pitch, you know, Doghead Simulations, a VR company, to him, right? And so I'm living in Rio at the time. I was living in Rio de Janeiro for three and a half years, and so I go to Baja da Tijuca, which is like this suburban. It's kind of like Miami. It's like 
it looks sort of like Miami, uh, very, very suburban, a lot of, a lot of rich people there. And I get into this gated community, which was hard to get into because it was like a secret entrance or something. And I go into this guy's house and it's got like the huge walls with the pool. It looks like I'm at like a Colombian drug Lords, you know, manner basically. And I get in and it's this, you know, heavy set guy who kind of has like this, like, this like mafia vibe, you know, just this powerful mafia vibe, but also very nice and very charming, welcoming. And he literally has a guy who's making picanha, making steak as we're having conversations over wine, like a, a dedicated steak maker, picanha maker. Um, and it feels like I'm in a movie, right? And I don't speak, I have like intermediate Portuguese. I can have basic conversations, but you wouldn't, I literally raised like $150,000 in Portuguese, even though I could barely speak Portuguese. <laughs> And it was just the weird, I thought I was like, am I getting mafia money? What's happening here? It felt like I was in a movie because I was like dealing with a guy that has a dedicated steak maker, you know, you know, that sits there and drinks wine slowly as I, but anyways, um, there's my random story about raising money. Well, I see one of the questions in there is literally, how do you find angel investors? And I think that's a very difficult answer because the reality is at the end of the day, um, Augie's really right. You need to be going out there and making connections and reaching out to people because you never know who's going to be the connection that ends up making something happen. Um, just I've been helping another company close around recently and they're related to sports cards. And the thing is, you, you kind of just realize that these people out there, well, they also have that hobby. And people who have that hobby oftentimes have disposable income, tend to be a little higher on that scale. So, you know, He's been reached out to by dozens of people who just are like, hey, you know, I, I I like sports cards. Tell me about your pitch, you know, and suddenly you just start meeting people that way. Um, it, it can be very difficult other than honestly going out there and putting yourself out there. I know when I've talked to Augie in the past, he said the best advice he had was literally to just go to San Francisco, go to Boston, go to New York and try to take meetings, you know, schedule ahead of time, you know, and you got to get time. I mean, the nice thing about the pandemic more than anything is it's made Zoom meetings a little more socially acceptable and the understanding of we don't need to physically shake hands to close a deal a little yeah. bit easier, but that face-to-face -face time is still really hard to... It's, it's very important, face-to-face mm -hmm. -face time. Um, I, I would say, uh, what are investors' typical watering holes? You know, where do they go for water? Uh, and you, you typically you see investors go to investor meetups, tech meetups. Um, okay, I'll tell you uh, how I met my first investor uh, for for Trendy back in 2010. Um, and this was this was actually like a year before I we we started uh, the company and made Dungeon Defenders. So I was um, back then I was uh, I was just a programmer. I was working on some vision processing stuff. Uh, for another startup, and um, um, I was at it was it was at a Christmas party for a condo association, where not only my main investor but like six other prominent angels in town live in this like quasi fancy condo um, unit in downtown Gainesville. Um, you know, and I wanted to be in the tech scene and I, I want to, um, meet all these people. So, you know what, I'm going to go to this party sort of invited. I need a friend of a friend who lives there. So I, I get in, I get in <laughs> and, um, you know, it's free drinks and all, all that stuff. And, um, um, he, my investor tells the story better than I do, but literally I was, I was sort of sticking, thinking about work. I'm always thinking about work. I was staring in the water fountain. And I was like, in my head, I'm trying to like calculate how a computer would analyze the light refracting off, reflecting off the surface of the water and how a computer could, could determine whether it's about to hit the water or something like that. And um, my, my, my investor comes up and he says, <laughs> he's like, what are you staring at? <laughs> it's sort of funny. You know, instead of being like um, abrasive, I'm like, oh, I'm trying to... Um, come up with an algorithm that calculates uh, 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 basically the texture complexity of a surface of surface of water um, uh, for a computer system. And then um, that's how he got intrigued by me. 
And we, we formed a, a relationship from that. And fast forward a year from that point, he became my primary investor. And then we made this game, Dungeon Defenders. Um, yeah. So, so you, you have to put, your, like John said, you have to put yourself out there. You have to put in, your, in you have to go to the same watering holes mm-hmm. as the other investors. Um, I'll tell you that most investors are impressed by people with technical abilities and not impressed by like salesmen, like CEO salesman type, because that's their type, you know? And so they're looking for someone that's very not like them, someone that's really, really good at, you know, programming, that, that's not trying to pull over the wool over their eyes about money. You know, they kind of want someone who doesn't really know money stuff, you know, because <laughs> you know, you're probably not trying to pull something. And to uh, Christopher mentioned that, um, let me see, Christopher Kimberlin said, is there a major point of venture capitalists if they don't come in until the 10 million revenue mark? I would say there's like 1 million because every time we were like, the most common thing we heard is like, come back when we hit the 1 million revenue mark. At 10 million, I, I never heard. I mean, there's some truth to that. There are some Yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. It's around 1 million. Um, yeah. But then they want to invest ten million dollars. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Two thirds of your company. You yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> no, and I see a question in there about like what's the most important connection you've made in your opinion. And I mean, for me at least, I think that's hard to answer because it really just depends on what you need at any given time. You know, like the reality is, like I wouldn't have met Augie if it weren't for the fact that I showed up at his office and was testing some stuff back when I was in law school just because uh, a press friend of mine said, hey, go meet this guy. You know, and then I bump into him almost eight years later, to be honest, at a uh, convention. And all of a sudden, he and I are hanging out all the time talking about how we can grow Dungeon Defenders and how we can grow Chromatic. You know, and that turns into a great relationship. You know, same kind of thing with Chance. Like, you know, I wouldn't have met Chance if I hadn't been putting myself out there and trying to meet new people. You know, and I think you and I, uh, we, we met, met a, a couple of times at like a pitch Synapse contest. Orlando. Yeah. Isn't it? That's yeah. where we finally, I think, talked a little more. But yeah, no, we. Yeah, that's when I found out you're a lawyer. And I was like, you're a lawyer? I was like, you're a lawyer? I thought you're just some dude that likes games. I guess both well, are true. And, and that's literally, <laughs> honestly, part of what it comes down to, to an extent, is you can't go out there trying to sell people, trying mm-hmm. to only build a relationship to get something out of it. You have to legitimately be trying to build connections with people if they're ever going to benefit you long term. Because if you're not looking out for other people, too, it's very, very easy to kind of smell the sleaze. You You know, the LA thing, the LA thing. (laughs) As much as I love LA, there's there's a truth to that. 100%. And especially in a profession like mine, which is legal, you know, like I intentionally dress like this for a reason. I don't try to show up in a suit all the time because that doesn't feel super normal to my client base um so that's that's definitely something super interesting and um, something that I, i've learned that you know to kind of counter the you know la mentality not to generalize everyone in la but that i'm talking to you to get something sometimes take the opposite approach and john might somewhat disagree agree with me here um but i'm taking this with a grain of salt it's okay to take to it's okay to take small opportunities to trust somebody that you don't know Obviously, don't put your whole company on the line. <laughs> but sometimes, when you extend your 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 trust to other people that you're potentially doing business with, obviously, only do this if you got a good vibe about the person. You're gonna have to sniff it out a little bit. People will see that and they'll be like, "Oh, this person is legit." You know, they they don't feel like you're just there for the money because they extended a little bit of trust. They told me something they didn't have to, or or they trusted me with something that they didn't have to. Just make sure those things aren't way too big. You don't want to put everything on the line. But No, for me in my position, I'm definitely one of those people who trust paper more than people a lot of the time. Yeah. And the reality That's is... That's a, you're a lawyer, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But at the same time, you have to be willing to trust people to some extent. You have to be willing to, you know, um, build those relationships. But like you said, you want to be careful with when it's a bigger decision or when it's yeah. a bigger thing to, again have a second set of eyeballs, look at it. Like one of the biggest mistakes I see in the game industry period is a lot of companies out there don't want to pay for professional services, whether it's an accountant or a lawyer or whatever else. And I, I, one of the things I got told back in the day more than anything, and uh, it was always, you know, well, I could hire another programmer for that cost and I need to get my game out. But the reality is 
if you're not thinking about your game holistically as a company, you know, you can make a lot of mistakes and you, you really need someone who can watch your back on some of this stuff. Um, especially uh, back before steam got a little bit bigger when like XBLA was the, the big kind of outlet for getting an indie game onto a console. It was uh, a very difficult process because you had to go through uh, a lot of different things through certification with Microsoft. And you had to oftentimes buy a publisher slot from a retail publisher, you know, who would then give you access to it. But even then, if you went through someone like Microsoft, they could play hardball with you. You know, and if you didn't bring an attorney to the table, you don't know what terms of the deal you actually get to push back on. Um, just this past weekend, I had a streamer client of mine where uh, a major company, you know, posted some of his content without his permission. He wasn't aware of it. It wasn't related to the, the game he was streaming or anything like that. And all of a sudden, you know, he's like, what can I do? And I got it sorted for him. Dude's walking away with, you know, 2000% of what he originally got paid for that content. He's incredibly happy, you know, but the reality is like, you, you need to know who you can look to for support when those kind of bad situations do come up. Sure. Uh, there was a question about um, re what investors actually expect. Where's my chat? I just lost it. <laughs> um, where do they? Okay. Everyone is talks about getting the money and needing the money, but what is it in for the investors? What are the most common things offered to the investors? A mostly a percentage return on investment. Yeah, you own a percentage of the company, and so they're, you know, planning on selling that that chunk that they own um, at a much higher rate. Um, otherwise, maybe some free steam free steam keys for the game. You know. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, video game um, investing is often a little different than typical startup investing. Uh, oftentimes, you there's some investment groups out there. Uh, outside of Kickstarter, well, Kickstarter is sort of crowdfunding, but there's some uh, angel groups that actually specialize in video games. Um, and they, um, um, Figs, Figs, Fig was one of them, F-I-G, Fig. Uh, they just got acquired by another VC firm, but they would come in and they would give you, let's say, you know, 200 grand. And um, the way they got paid back was a rev share. So, you know, your Steam revenue, you know, 100%, whatever, 20% would, some 20 or 30% would go to this investment group. And a lot of video game um, investments are structured that way. It's, it's, sim it's similar to the, the movie industry. There's a lot of parallels between video games and movies um, that you find. So, um, um, you know, mo most startups, they, they give out equity or convertible notes, which is debt that can convert to equity. So, Give you hundred grand, I get ten percent of your company, and hopefully we sell the company in five years or something like that. Um, you still see those deals, but oftentimes what I'm seeing um, is of uh, rev share structured deals where I give you hundred grand, but I get ten percent of your your game sales. Um, so you'll see a lot of that. Well, and I definitely think on my side, a lot of what I see is people working uh, nine to five to then work five to nine. So what they do is they figure out a way to either get a day job that pays well and then kind of work on their project on the side and then eventually fully transition over after they've been able to build up some savings and a little bit of buffer. Or they go out and they build up a contracting end of their own business. And I mean, having that contracting end of your own business is a much easier way to stabilize income in an industry that's become very hit driven. Uh, the reality is when, when you're in the video game industry, everybody wants to make the next Fortnite. You know, if you talk to a VC, that's what they want to see. They don't want to see that you're going to get them a decent return. They want to hear that you're going to make the next Fortnite and have this game that blows up beyond belief. You know, they don't want just steady income because they could get that yeah. elsewhere. That's another thing um, you need to sort of watch out, especially when you hit the VC round. Um, at the VC round, they want to see a hit. Mm -hmm. And they're willing to risk the entire company for a hit. Uh, so high risk, they're, they're all for high risk. So let's say a scenario where like 10% chance that you'll have a hit, but 90% chance it'll fail and destroy everyone's life. They will take <laughs> that 10% chance. And, and then invest in 10 companies. 
Yeah, like that comment tally can actually be bad because um, if they were willing to like destroy an entire company just for that slim chance, um, I'm not sure that's a good culture. Uh, you know, um, that's a that's like another. That's that's his another entire topic another other time. topic. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so that's like another time. Like I think there's a couple questions in there that even kind of touch on that. Like, how do you evaluate good and bad deals and stuff like that and good and bad oh, relationships? Yeah, yeah. And the reality is, even within your own company, that's a struggle. Like if you make a company with let's say four founders and one of them just turns out to be an Let's. toxic individual, <laughs> that can be very, very problematic. And yeah. You can put yourself in a situation where even if that person's your best employee, sometimes you got to let them go, you know, or you got to change things up just to, to make it work. Uh, I see chance with the, the cat nod. And the we're definitely there. agreeing me and my cat. <laughs> He's in total agreement. He'll agree the whole meeting if I make him. <laughs> um, but that's a great segue into bad business deals. Like for instance, imagine if you're able to buy a multi-billion dollar franchise for pennies. <laughs> I'm going to take this off. This is distracting. Hold on. <laughs> <clears throat> Makes me want to nod with it. <laughs> so let's, okay, chat, chat, ready for this. Let's throw, um, how much do you guys think Activision paid for Infinity Ward, the creators of Call of Duty? Don't Google it. Just throw some numbers out there. Come on, chat. 400,000, 500 million, 100 million, 60 million, $100. Hundred dollars. That's the closest one, actually. <laughs> <laughs> is that the closest one? Hundred dollars? No, I think four hundred thousand, isn't it? Oh yeah, sorry, four hundred thousand. I thought he just like rigged the game of prices. I right see a two point three mil, which looks pretty close. Oh, okay, there we go. All right, so um, Infinity Ward was purchased for five million dollars about halfway through the development of the original Call of Duty on PC. Um, I was twenty, twenty-one. Um, I owned 1% of the company because I was brand new. I was literally just out coming out of an internship. And so the sale of the entire franchise was included with that, obviously, netted me $50,000 before tax. So about 30 grand. So $30,000. And that's why I drink from this golden <laughs> full sale cup. No, <laughs> um, so lesson is don't. I guess it's don't sell your company for too little, right? <laughs> I, I think the lesson there even is like, you know, to <clears throat> when you're starting these off, sometimes you take some bad deals. I mean, it, it's just kind of a fact. Um, you see this pretty yeah. frequently. Um, you guys probably wouldn't have been able to start Infinity Ward without some of those initial contract payments from the publisher. Well, here's what happened. Um so here's the story of how Call of Duty was created, like summed up pretty quickly. Uh, we all worked on Medal of Honor. It was an EA franchise, Steven Spielberg spinoff. Um, we made the most successful, or the actually it was the first PC Medal of Honor game, but it was the highest rated Medal of Honor game that ever existed. And so EA was very happy. But the guy that ran the company that we worked for was a little, I don't want to talk too bad about him. He actually just passed, but he, we didn't like working with the guy, right? We'll just say that. And um, as a result, 22... Of the 30 people there, we just quit. We we're like, um, actually, what happened? He fired uh, our producer that everybody loved, Grant, right? And everyone loved the guy. And we we're like, why would you fire Grant? And then, about, I don't know, six weeks later or so, I get a call on my phone and it's Grant. And he's saying, hey, Chance, how you doing? Just catching up with me. And I was like, what are you doing, Grant? What have you been up to? Oh, I'm starting a new company. I was like, you're starting a video game company. Are you back in California? He's like, no, I'm actually in Tulsa. I was like, where are you going to find game developers in Tulsa, Oklahoma? I mean, come on. That's like the worst place. He was like, maybe you should come over to my house tonight. <laughs> so he invites me over to his house and I go in and it's just a big group of, of people from 2015 people I work with and I just assumed it's like well we're all friends so we're hanging out and then about an hour into the party is like people are like hey have you talked to Chance yet and they, they're like no we haven't and so I step outside with Grant and he tells me so Electronic Arts doesn't want to work with the head of 2015 either we don't want to work with them and so EA is actually funding the expansions for this new company I'm started and everyone in that house is in the new company and that was about half of Infinity Ward was in that house right and so as a reason, and I, so I said, um, I asked if the guy that hired me, if he was in the company too, if he was coming, he's like, yep, he's the one that actually requested you come. So I was like, okay, I'm in. I didn't even think about it. I was just like, these are my people. And 
things were going well, but they're going somewhere else. So I'm going with my people. You know, I just kind of trusted them. I was, like I said, like 20. So 21. Um, and so that's how Infinity War got started. We had to create a franchise that would compete with Medal of Honor. But the great thing that we had is we didn't have EA trying to tell us from the creative side what to do. So we had total freedom to make a really good game. And that's how we added stuff like, you know, aiming down the site. I believe uh, Call of Duty 1 was the first you know, AAA game to have that feature. It was in Red Orchestra, the, the, the mod before that, but first AAA game. Lots of cool stuff they wouldn't just allow us to do. Um, and yeah, and then what happened is halfway through the Spearhead expansion pack for Medal of Honor, they said, we're going to absorb all of you into our Bel Air studio, you know, which is the core Medal of Honor team, or we're not going to pay you for your work. And we had people with like families that had to pay people. And so the heads of our company, they're scrambling around talking to all these publishers and like had to find some kind of deal soon because people, people weren't getting paid, right? And so EA lost Call of Duty, basically. And then uh, it, Activision eventually lost Titanfall and apex legends <laughs> because all those people that left infinity ward you know we had all the we wanted to make science fiction games for a long time but you know f well for example modern warfare was rejected by activision they showed us the chart of the success of world war ii games and they said why would you make anything than world war ii so we had to go behind activision's back we locked them out of the studio for three months didn't let anyone from the publisher into our studio and made a prototype for modern warfare even though they said said we couldn't do it <laughs> and then we showed it to them and they were pissed but then they're like this is awesome but fuck you guys because <laughs> what are you <laughs> like we three months of hiding this from us that's they were so angry but so happy and then we made them billions of dollars so off of that five million dollar investment that was kind of a tangent but <laughs> it's still an awesome story that's a great every time story. i hear it because like it, it, it's just kind of mind-blowing to realize again you know like how humble the roots are of some of these things. Like, you know, it's just like a backyard barbecue spawns off the biggest franchise in entertainment media of all time outside of maybe Grand Theft Auto, you know, like the top two for sure. Um, there's a question in chat about fearing for your making a bad reputation either by running into legal issues or plagiarism or something like that and trying to come back from a horrible reputation. Um, from that perspective, the first thing I would just tell you with that is to not overstress the legal side when you're making a game, unless you're going out there and making a fan game and or appropriating other people's likeness without having their permission, you're probably not doing anything too wrong. Um, unless you're just like straight up stealing the code, you know, uh, you're not going to get in trouble for a copycat game. The reality is you can't copyright uh, mechanics to a game uh, you know Augie has this awesome tower defense loot game um, the reality is somebody else could make a tower defense loot game you know there's nothing that says like that is only him you know and the reality is you see that all the time you wouldn't have games like Dota or League of Legends or even Counter-Strike if it weren't for the fact that they were largely modded from other games and eventually came around but when it comes to fixing kind of a bad reputation or building back from that, that's where it can be really difficult. And I would definitely say the biggest thing there that I've seen is the people who normally end up with a bad rep are the people who try to abuse the legal system from the other direction. And that's when you're trying to go around bullying people saying like, I own this idea and you don't actually own it. You know, I have a patent here and you, you don't even know what that word means, you know, and you're just randomly coming at people with kind of, very negative kind of feedback like that. And that's where I normally see bad reputations kind of spawn either that or just treating your employees like crap, you know, and that's a, a terrible place to end up, you know? Um, we got some questions I think here, or comments. We see my dream is on a su successful video game creation company. Do you think it's possible to do in the U S currently? Yes. There are very many successful game companies, in the United States. I don't know if you're and saying that with all the craziness, the division and all the madness in America right now, that's people are staying home and playing more games. So the, the lockdown has actually increased uh, gaming revenue substantially. Um, I think you can make your Exorcist Rambo Samuel L. Jackson game as long as it's very satirical, right? Uh, potentially. As long as you don't <laughs> call it. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, mean, potentially. Yeah. 
It's it's just very, big satire. Like, we're getting very fact specific like. with this, and the uh, the number one answer an attorney will ever give you when you get facts no. this big <laughs> is it depends. Because yeah. the reality is, there's ways that you could make that work, but you're gonna have to be very thoughtful with when you do things. You know, How like, people Rockstar love did? to use words like fair use and parody without knowing what they actually mean. Uh, fair use is a perfect example because a lot of people will just say, I can do that. It's fair use. Well, mm-hmm. typically fair use normally wants it to be non-commercial. Uh, the moment you start trying to do it just to make money, that's a very big strike against that concept. And not only that, to argue that you're doing something's fair use is to say, yes, I am infringing on someone else's content, but it's okay. So what you're saying is, yeah, I'm definitely doing something wrong, but you should overlook it. You know, it's not this giant, you know, sword that lets you run around the room and basically be like, I can do anything I want. It's more of a yeah. shield that says, in very limited situations, it's totally good for me to do something. An example of that would be like if I wanted to put up a trailer right now to show you guys the difference between two different games and why one is maybe slightly similar to another, it's largely for educational purposes. Yeah. I'm not showing it to you to try to highlight my own product or make money myself. And that changes things mm. dramatically. I, um, I think uh, one of the biggest concerns with hiring a lawyer is how much it's going to cost, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that a lot of any developers, they think they're going to necessarily have to incur, you know, AAA type, type of fees uh, to do everything right. But like John kind of, let's say you're out of school, you've got a group of, of five people that got together to get kind of like the basic requirements done legally to, to protect them. Like what, what are typically people spending for legal costs? At least you can only represent yourself, but yeah, to get a basic company up, it really just depends Mm. on how gold plated you want your stuff in a lot of ways, you know, how much work is being customized and how much isn't, I mean, setting up a LLC in the state of Florida, you don't need me. You can literally just go to SunBiz and type it in. The reality is what you do need me on is knowing whether or not you should even be an LLC or if you should even be in Florida to begin with. The reality is a lot of people, especially when you're looking for investment, are going to put their company in Delaware and they're going to potentially even do it as a C-Corp. LLCs are nice because LLCs allow you a lot more flexibility and a lot more control a lot of the time. You don't have to deal with a board of directors or any of that stuff. Uh, But depending on your situation and what you're looking to do, you might want to set it up differently. Uh, One of the biggest things I think I see mistakes on is people not getting some form of operating agreement, partnership agreement, bylaws, depending on what entity you are in place. Because the reality is having something like that allows you to not kind of fight with each other. And it gives you a little bit more structure to work with because you know when to stay in your own lane. So getting that plus the company set up, plus some of the basic, you know, assignment docs, I mean, it's a couple grand. You're not looking at like this exorbitant cost. Um, And I think a lot of people get scared off thinking it's going to be, you know, 50K to start their own company. The reality is it's definitely going to be under five. You know, and the reality is it really just depends on what you need. Um, Yeah, and that under five will save you way over five. (laughs) Well, the the reality is if that doesn't save you 100 grand, I'll be mind blown because the reality is it's going to almost always help you out. Um, And one of the other things that I, I saw in here Um, let me see if I can remember someone was asking about video game patents. Um, and someone else was asking about IP. I just want to answer those both really, really quickly. Um, so when it comes to intellectual property, a lot of what you're going to be looking at when it comes to a video game is you can copyright your game. You can trademark your name or the name of the game or the name of the company. So a trademark is going to protect people from basically, Like if I wanted to try to claim that I was associated with Dungeon Defenders and stick that logo on my stuff, Augie would be able to be like, no, you know, that's kind of what that's going to do. You know, trademarks are all over the place. You see them everywhere. You know, that Dodgers logo on Chance's hat is going to be a trademark. Um, A copyright will cover the game. The reality is with that game, it's going to be, people are going to think they get more copyrighted than they actually do. You have the game itself if you register it, and that's a process that a lot of people forget about. Um, But even then, you're not going to be able to just block people from doing the same kind of concept. An example I always use is the game Threes in 2048. If you put them on a screen, they look identical. You slide one number from here, and it grows. You know, a two becomes a four, a three becomes a six, and it's just a puzzle game. 
they're literally the same game. You can't tell someone they can't copy the main mechanics. So that's not really going to be a thing. And when it comes to video game patents, that is where it gets expensive. Patents are insane. Um, I can just tell you now that if you start trying to talk patents, you're looking at, you need at least 20K to even like go through that process fully. Um, I don't even do that process. The people who do patents are very, very um, specific just to patents, you know, and that's where it's going to be something that you need to talk to an expert and even make sure that it's worth your time investigating. Because the reality is when it comes to software, it's probably not. Um, it, it can get very expensive quickly. Um, I did see another question, though, that I would like to mention. Um, someone asking about, is uh, California the best place to start a company? Um, you just heard from Chance that his started in Tulsa. And Augie, you're in Gainesville. I'm in Gainesville. And you can definitely talk to why you like Florida. Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, well, first of all, California is too expensive. Mm -hmm. um, like in the Bay Area, if I'm looking for just like a junior engineer, I'm looking at 160000 a year kind of a thing. In Florida, like you can pick up in an engineer 50 k ish um, it, It's And then on top of that, here's a big one. In the Bay Area, the churn rate is about 14%. So every year, 14% of your employees are going to leave. You have to rehire them. Um, it's much lower in Gainesville where I, I feel like there isn't such competition and pressure for, for talent. Um, so I, I love Florida for that, that reason. It's, it's, for me, it's feasible to, uh, to start a company at a reasonable price just yeah. to piggyback off that a little bit i i think um orlando is honestly kind of poised to grow and i know that's a frustrating answer if you're a student and you're looking for work and you don't see it um because obviously ea is huge um but there's also you know the entire simulation industry is using game design talent uh you got the attractions industry that's using game design talent there's plenty of kind of enterprise level companies that are looking for game designers and programmers and various other spatial computing wizards in a sense that do stuff with AR, VR and all this other stuff. And the reality is a lot of you guys are learning those same tools and it's, it's a very good spot to get plugged in outside of that. But on top of that, we have a growing indie game community. Yeah. And I know this is something that Augie and I are still talking about all the time. Yeah, uh, is on, like On that note, um... I'm hiring four positions. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, uh, like, I'm time for to advertise. Designer. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm looking for a, a, a CM. I'm looking for uh, producers. Um, so sign up. I'm, I'm looking to hire good people. I just put in a, um, I'm totally uh, selling my laptop. <laughs> See, see how I put I, it up. I don't people. have anything to talk right now. So, I mean, I'm like, I'm looking. There's 73 people interested in games here. Someone's going to want to buy a $1,000 <laughs> laptop with a, with a GTX 1080. So, also reach out <laughs> if you have questions about the industry. This is not just about me making a, a buck off you guys, but I want to sell that <laughs> and build a new laptop for my, my wife. Who's dealing with? You have the, the exact same laptop I have right here. <laughs> what is? Is it covered? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, the MSI with the the oh, okay. uh, 1080. Yeah, well. yeah, and it's a great, it's a great machine. It's right? Great, it's a great okay. laptop. All right, enough of advertising that. Payment yeah. plans. I'll consider it. <laughs> um, I will, no, I, I saw someone saying that they think all the jobs are on the West Coast, and I would definitely say I would challenge that a little bit. Especially now. <laughs> especially now, especially with the fact that telecommuting is possibly going to become yeah. more prevalent. But there's plenty of jobs out there in Texas. There's plenty of jobs in Florida. There's plenty of jobs in Atlanta. Yeah. There's. It, it's definitely more difficult if you live in the middle of kind of rural America, because I don't personally know Minnesota, where, like, you know, yeah, but like, yeah. Games. yeah. So, I mean, there's definitely, there's definitely stuff just about everywhere. I know full sale is a very distributed group. A lot of times. Yeah. And I actually had a, the, the city of Tulsa offered me $10,000 to move to Tulsa and work remotely. Mm -hmm. 
So like there's, there's actually like foundations and government programs out there that are trying to get people to move to these Midwestern cities because it's really inexpensive to live and they're working from home anyways. Mm -hmm. If you're going to work from home, why work from home in Silicon Valley paying, you know, $4,000 a month for a two bedroom apartment or whatever it costs, you know, where you could live elsewhere. Well, and I see a really good question from uh, Christopher talking about if we think that telecommuting is going to uh, stick around after COVID. And I think that's definitely an answer that Augie, you have a lot of experience oh, with. with uh, the fact yeah, that uh, I'm not a shot. fan. I'm not a fan of work at home, especially for something as creative and collaborative as game game development. Um, I, I think um, our production capacity has significantly been hit from working at home. The mere fact that if, if I have a question about a certain, let's say, game design, I have to arrange a meeting with two other people. Just arranging the meeting takes like five hours. <laughs> and then all these things compound, game development slows down significantly. And you lose so much creativity when you're the energy that like the energy is not of, there. Yeah. The energy is not there. And then there's also a psychological um, component when you're isolated in a closet. <clears throat> um, and it, 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 it sinks everyone down. So I'm not a fan of work from home. Like I would and every day. My, Word. my game devs, we're, we're, we're not happy about it. It's, it I, I would literally every day at Infinity Ward go by at least one or two departments, just walk by and say, hey, what's up? Just just say hello, yeah. especially yeah. audio people. If you're ever at a game studio, go visit the audio people because they're usually in a cave, a dark cave, and they don't get a lot of visitors <laughs> because people feel like they're going to be interrupted, you know, because they've got their headphones on or whatever. Um, so, yeah, visit your audio people at, at your studios. Mm -hmm. Montana. Cool. I had um, my brother lives in Montana in Livingston. And I had a business out there for a little bit. Well, I know, uh, Chance, you have some some crazy stories, even just from what it's like working in AAA, because that can be completely different. Yeah, world. should I, should we tell the? I, I was right. thinking I'd love to hear a little bit more Waking. about your experience with dogs. Okay, all right. So this is time where where I share. I'm going to share this uh, screen share. Um, pick the right window. Where's my? Are you guys seeing this uh, Modern Warfare thing yet? No, uh, no. I see my dad, the plasma physicist. Okay, well, it's not my dad. <laughs> not your dad? <laughs> okay, let me. Oh, here we go. It's trying to share here. I'm going to close this, and it's. Gonna work. Oops, yeah, that's window. Free, it's, that's, it could have yeah, been a worse. I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> you guys know my secret. I'm really into physics. <laughs> let me tell you about 9.8 meters squared. All right. Um, now, do you still? We still no? see the same screen. Oh my gosh! Okay, I'm gonna do it one more time, and it doesn't work. I'm just gonna do it without because I don't want to make this forever. Um, it's all good. There we go. <laughs> one more time. Okay, now do you see YouTube? That I'm putting in right now. Yeah. Uh, yes, we do. YouTube. All right, cool. All right, cool. Now, now I can do this. Um, so if you guys played Modern Warfare um, 1, oh, come on. You may remember um, this mission, All Gillied Up, where you're climbing through in a ghillie suit, taking out all these guys. Um, and if you miss, uh, German Shepherds come out and they try to kill you, right? So I was the one that was asked to demo this in Leipzig, Germany at Gamescom. And if you don't know Gamescom, Gamescom is European E3. It's the... You know, next to China Joy, which probably none of you will go to, it's it's the biggest um, game event in the world as far as attendees go, right? And so there was no God mode; they wouldn't put God mode on. So I had to literally at at my desk practice this level like 20, 30 times to make sure that every single time I sniped a guy, I actually got the headshot and they died. Because what happens? The dog comes out, and why why does it matter if the dogs come out? Well. German media is very sensitive. They had a little thing, little incident in the 40s and the 30s. And since that incident, they're just very, very sensitive to everything, the media, right? And so Activision is like, whatever you do, you have to make every shot. You cannot kill the dogs. You cannot kill the dogs, right? And so I'm getting, I get through here. I, I get through this part. I'm going to fast forward. And then it gets to, let me see here. Oh, I think I might have skipped it. But there's a part where you actually <laughs> shoot a guy from a tower, right? 
It's somewhere over here, right, right here. So there's this guy that's walking back and forth on this little tower area, and I pull the trigger, but he walks right behind the support column right as I, I pull it, and the dogs come out. So at this point, I'm just running in circles from the dogs because I want to look like I'm playing. I don't want to look I'm not, like I'm not trying to kill the dogs, but I don't want to kill the dogs. And so I'm running in circles. And you know how if you, like, if you play a shooter and you ever tense up and you melee because R3, you know, R3 is melee and you squeeze the controller because you're tense and nervous and you're like accidentally meleeing when you should be shooting or something. I did that, except in the case where the German shepherds jump at you, if you R3 at the right time, you grab them by the neck and you just snap it. And that's what I did. I snapped the German shepherd's neck in front of 500 European media people at the reveal. And it was just like dead silence. And then all of a sudden there's one guy who's like, yeah. And then all of a sudden, everyone starts coming in, ye yeah, cheering and yelling. No one wanted to be the first ones to like yell and get excited about what just happened because it was kind of like jarring. <laughs> but everyone secretly thought it was awesome, and they had to get other people to laugh so they feel so they felt uh, safe laughing. But later that day, um, you know, this was actually in Australia at a Activate Asia. It's a big Asian um, event, Asian Australian Activision event. I was on a on a boat with uh, Kotaku Australia, just talking to a journalist. And you know about that story. And the next day, there was a story on Kotaku that said Infinity Ward hates puppies. So there's that. I will unshare. And I mean, that's just the reality when you're doing any of this stuff in real time. You just get some crazy moments like that. <laughs> yeah, there's this side. weird like people want to put a certain. They don't want to be the first one to laugh at like something like that, but it's secretly everyone's laughing because you know it's a game. No one was actually hurt. We had to make the dog's eyes more evil, actually, because you can't have dogs that look too friendly in games. They have to be like zombie dogs. All righty, here we at. We got is it two? Is it we in at four, or do we have more time? I think that might be the end. We can um, go until we can keep going until about four fifteen. Do you want a chance? Okay. Yeah, maybe do some more QA if if you guys yeah, have more I questions. I got time for some more QA. If there's the, questions. the most valuable thing you could do right now is probably ask legal questions, but I'm willing to answer <laughs> anything too. Well, I, I think there's a good question for for you and Augie a little bit on trying to pitch an idea. What can you do to make sure that your submission doesn't end up on the bottom of the stack and they don't even look at it? Um, so, what advice would you have there, um, other than have a really good pedigree? of previous work uh you meet the people that are making the decisions mm -hmm. if you meet the person making decisions at like gdc or at some game event and say hey i'm going to submit a and nice meeting i'm going to submit a, a proposal they'll read your proposal if you just if you just randomly email someone your pitch what are the chances i almost drowned someone apparently wow I almost fell in this pool I am cleaning. Like who's who's like I'm doing a Zoom call while I'm cleaning a pool. Like that's some multitasking right there. <laughs> that is impressive. Um, <laughs> <I'm> very impressed. <laughs> but I, I think Augie's answer honestly applies to if you're trying to apply for a job too. So honestly, it doesn't matter whether you're trying to start a company and get someone to fund it or you know work with you on it. It's the same thing if you're trying to get a job. The best advice you can have is to go out there and try to meet people. And I mean, the reality is, yes, it sounds easy to just say, go to GDC, go to this. The reality is you don't have to. You can do it on vehicles like LinkedIn. You can do it on Twitter. You can do it over other things. If you reach out to people politely, you'd kind of be amazed at who's willing to take a call. Um, just for example, for myself, back when I was still in law school, I got incredibly lucky because Microsoft actually, uh, on a visit I was having with them already for some press stuff, said, hey, we know you're in law school. Would you like to talk to the head of legal for 30 minutes? And I'm like, yeah, uh, why would you say no to that? You know, that's not an opportunity that you almost ever get. You know, so I got to sit down and talk to him. And his thing was, he's like, listen, my kids are about your age too. You know, I would hope that if, uh, you know, someone had the ability to help them out, they'd do it too. You know, so he kind of sat down with me and just talked about a bunch of different things. And he gave me advice on like, areas of law that he thought were going to be relevant for the game industry moving forward. Uh, one of the things that stuck with me was privacy and that obviously you look at today's society and that is basically currency, you know, like whether or not your data is secure is a huge, huge, big deal anymore. 
Any other questions, guys? We got, uh, let me see, favorite color, blue green. Got through that one. I, I like the one Logan's got in there. And I'll Where ask this to you guys. Um, what would you say is one of the worst mistakes you've made in your career? And what's some advice on how to avoid some of those mistakes that people could make? Um, I would say for me, it was, and one of my particular startups, um, getting involved with it, like bringing someone into the company that I didn't know just because I trusted the person uh, really well that knows them. That doesn't mean they're right. Um, I don't want to get out here. Because just basically vet, like if there's someone get, coming into your company that you don't know, even if other people know them, make sure you vet them because even they can be wrong. Um, that is, I'm not saying there's any mal type of uh, situation there, but as far as just like you have to, make sure people are legit and they're not going to try to screw you. Um, I think we mentioned that earlier. Yeah. I'm I trying to find I, a more poetic way to put it out there, but I'm not knowing a little bit about that kind of situation. I think one of the other things you can look at is like, what could you have had in place to kind of protect yourself moving forward if things don't work out, you know? And that's one of the biggest things that is really possible is when you do work with someone like an attorney, it's a lot easier to kind of protect yourself if there is eventual fallout or if things need to get, you know, decided and changed up, you know, you have a lot more flexibility. And the thing I always tell people is I, I get a lot of people come up to me and they're like, Hey, I pulled this off the internet. Can I use it? I'm like, first off, do you know what it says? That's like key. And if you don't know what it says, then you're agreeing to do something that you don't even know what it says. But the thing there is like, yeah, the rules for monopoly are great, but they don't work when you try to play Yahtzee. And you can't take one rule set from one thing and put it on another. Like you really need to understand that those things are, are, are meant to be flexible to give you every opportunity you need. You know, there's a reason why companies often do vesting stock uh, with a startup, you know, and that's one of those things where the whole point of that is we know that you might not stick around for forever, or we might even need to can you if you're doing something wrong, you know, and it's just kind of figuring out what you can do there. Yeah, there's a question um, about uh, what do producers look look for when trying to find sound design personnel. If you're applying to a sound design job at a game company, you're most likely it's actually the uh, sound engineers that are going to be critiquing, you know, whether or not um, they want to bring you in for an interview. Um, but I would say if you're getting into like sound design, you know, just um, you know, just try taking various unrelated sounds, putting them together, and creating something new. Um, I know that's kind of obvious. Um, but if you can, you know, you make some kind of horror sound, right? Some kind of sound in a horror game and then explain, I took a little bit, I took, uh, this recording of a pterodactyl and I took this recording of a pit bull and I took some, uh, chickens and I put them together and, uh, there you go. That's how I created that. Um, I'm not a sound designer, but I'm pretty sure that's how it works. <laughs> Don't record pterodactyls. It's very difficult. Hey guys, I saw a question that I thought was kind of cool. Um, it was from Jonathan and uh, let me see here. Hang on. Where did it go? I apologize. A student uh, at Full Sail living in New Jersey, yes. looking for possible job opportunities near home, but there isn't much compared to the West Coast. What would you uh, suggest as the ideal process of relocating? Is it common for game devs to help you relocate? And what would be the same for internships? Um, from my experience, I'll let these two kind of adjust what I say um, as people actually kind of hire people. Um, my experience is when I've worked with companies, we're not going to typically pay for relocation. Um, it's, it's a very competitive market, and that's just kind of where that comes down to, especially for, and this, this sounds bad, but for entry-level work yeah. is where it gets very difficult to ask for some of that stuff. One of the most frequent things, believe it or not, that I, I get brought to me is um, people from Canada or even another um, country wanting to work for a company in the U.S. and trying to get a visa. And the problem there is that can be a crazy hard process, especially right now with COVID. Um, that process has been largely halted. Um, so when it comes to those kind of fringe scenarios, that can be difficult. But even on the general ones, yeah. Um, it, it's not to say that you can't obviously move out somewhere when you're expecting yeah. to get work, but 
you may not get the help you're hoping for. Uh, do we have any international uh, students on the chat channel? If you do, just say where you're from or just say you're international. I don't care. I'm just curious because I think, you know, when you're talking remote, it's, you know, fairly simple if, say, you're an American working remotely in America. Um, I don't know, John, if you can talk about maybe there's some international students, maybe, you know, we got a lot of students from Brazil and Colombia, and um, they might want to know, can I legally work freelance, like remotely while I'm inside the borders here? Do I have to be back in Brazil to work freelance? You know, how how difficult is that? So I'm not an immigration expert, so I'm not going to talk for um, anything related to whether or not a student visa can do limited work. Um, that is not something under my purview, really, to be perfectly honest. But I definitely think, especially within the context of when you are um, back overseas, there, there's a lot more potential now than there was in the past to continue to work wherever you're at. Um, there, there's teams out there that are putting out great products from countries in South America, from uh, Eastern Europe, from um, honestly, Asia, anywhere, just if you, if you pick a location, there are people doing game development there. Yeah. And that's the I mean, cool thing about this industry. It is, don't limit yourself to America. Yeah. When you look definitely at don't limit yourself to America. Um, and having an education from here and then coming back is going to, it's going to help you tenfold, especially when you, you need to uh, be able to interact with investors or close yeah. a deal or, you know, kind of showcase why they should trust you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like, you know, if you get an opportunity to work on The Witcher 4 or something, you know, move mm -hmm. to Poland for a little while, <laughs> get that out of your belt. And if, if you don't like living in Poland, you've got now a AAA title under your belt. You can go back to the States and find employment probably much easier. Um, well, and that's one thing I'd always suggest for just about anybody is if you get an opportunity, even if it's not your dream job, take it and then you can pivot. It's so much easier when you have a little bit of experience to come back and be like, well, I really wanted to work on an RPG, but I'm working on, let's just use Madden, for example, because it's local. You know, yeah. that may not be your dream job, but you're going to learn skills. You're going to learn processes. You're going to get a ton of experience. And it makes it a lot easier to then go pivot and move somewhere else and work on something else. And it gets your, your foot in the door. Um, honestly, like, don't be too picky with those first opportunities because yeah, I work for free. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I see something about overwalk working at crunch and uh, the stigmatism against long working hours. Um, do you find it pretty normal that you work long hours every day for months on end? Or do you give yourself breaks? Um, I'm going to answer that from someone who is in largely the legal industry and not necessarily a game dev. And the reality is, uh, my job is very dependent on when work needs to get done. So for me, that may mean one week I work 60 hours. That may mean one work I work 80 hours. That may mean one week I don't work. You know, so it's like I have a lot of flexibility with stuff like that. But as someone who's working for themselves, you know, it can get chaotic. And for me, looking into the game industry, I always kind of sit back and see um, talks about crunch and stuff like that taken into a, a unique pathway because the reality is nobody thinks that crunch is an ideal situation and no one thinks you should be doing it. But the reality is like some level of overtime almost always is needed for just about any job. Um, especially when you're on like an ownership level, I'll let Augie yeah. kind of answer. Yeah. For the game um, that's side. interesting. Cause, um, you know, uh, years ago in, um, early trendy days, crunch was a significant part of, um, I, would, I would say the uh, of work. It was um, a lot of it was unavoidable. Um, but I think as my company matured, um, we actually at Chromatic have a, a no crunch policy. Um, I do not. It's I, I believe with cr proper production and pre planning, you can avoid it. Um, so right in the past, yes, we we had crunch. Um, but moving forward, like in my company currently, we, we try to avoid it when possible. Um, and w one thing that's actually helped with that is, uh, in the past we were, we had to appease the investor gods. <laughs> we, we had, we had VCs 
and publishers that demanded crunch. They demanded crunch. They demanded us meet our quarters. They demanded to meet certain figures. And um, about two years ago, um, I bought the company back from the VCs and implemented drastic changes. So I don't want people to feel like they have to do something. Uh, and it's a cultural thing. The question really is, is I want to make my employees feel like they want to do something. They want to make an awesome game and they want to make our, our fans happy as opposed to, oh, I have to meet my quarterly quotas. Oh, I have to like do this or I'm going to get in trouble. It's two different things, two different philosophies and cultures within a company. Yeah. Um, um, so I, and then I'll, I'll just end with this is um, um, if you look at the data, if you do your pre-production correctly and your pr production correctly, you can avoid 90% of the crunch. 90% of the crunch is because, oh, John said this, but Bob said this, and I spent two weeks working on the wrong thing. That's what happens most of the time. And, and if you do your pre-production correctly, your production correctly, you will avoid a lot of that. Yeah. I would say expect some crunch, but you shouldn't expect too much because then that company is taking advantage of you. Yeah, I, I would say, like you guys are saying, that if it's a week in, week out thing, that is not healthy by yeah. any means. And um, I just posted contact info. If you guys want to do the same, feel free to. Um, Augie for potential job. Yeah. John, if you have any law mm -hmm. stuff that comes up after graduation, I'm sure he'd be happy to help you. And I know that he has really, really affordable packages for you know small indie teams. So don't be scared of that too much. Definitely willing to work with you. Um, so... Yeah, um, the Call of Duty question, I guess we'll wrap up with that. Um, I've started playing uh, Warzone a lot. It's the first Call of Duty I've gotten into since Modern Warfare like 2, probably, even though I worked on 3 and Ghosts. Um, enjoying what's been coming out with the, the new, new Infinity Ward. It's kind of gone a little back to the classic, so I've seen a lot of that good talent come through. So I'm excited to see what they do next. Thanks again to Augie and Chance for joining me, and uh, thanks to Full Sail for having us. I really yeah, do appreciate so. it because for me, one of the most important things out there is just being able to help give back some business literacy and legal literacy to kind of help you guys along the way, you know, because there's a lot of different decisions that get made, especially, especially if you decide to go the more indie route and start your own thing. Uh, but even if you're working at a big AAA studio, there's, there's decisions you're going to want to be aware of, you know. Well, that's awesome. So uh, thank you guys so very much. Uh, I'm trying to join back in. I guess I can't, so you can't see me, but I um, want to thank you guys so much for this amazing uh, hour and 15 minutes. Um, really appreciate it. I laughed. I, I cried. This was, this was awesome. <laughs> thank you guys so much. Um, and thank you for our students and graduates for attending. You guys are amazing. Thanks so much for being here, everybody. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. See you thank hopefully you. on campus. Bye -bye. Hopefully. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>